Welcome to Prophetic Insights. I'm Hillary Henriquez. I'm Andrew Henriquez. Issues unfolding within the Seventh-day Adventist Church indicate clearly that the day of the Lord hasteth greatly. Central Kenya Conference President John Nguni recently sent out a letter to all of his pastors and elders dated May 23rd, 2016, placing a conference-wide ban on Pastor Jeremiah Davis, warning his pastors and elders not to invite him and not to support him. The letter also identifies other groups that should be shunned as well. And also, the president labeled Jeremiah Davis and other self-supporting preachers as savage wolves. Let's take a look at this letter. In this letter from the president, it's entitled Emerging Issues. In section A, we find four bullet points pertaining to Jeremiah Davis and other pastors who are preaching in their eyes controversial and divisive messages. We are going to analyze each of these four subheadings. Number one, Jeremiah Davis and others, they fight against church organization. In other words, this president of the Central Kenya Conference, he does not want any minister that will preach against the apostasies of this denomination. They cannot come into his territory as he has written. He wants preachers who are preaching smooth messages that will not touch the popular sins. And those preachers who preach revival and reformation based on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, he calls them savage wolves. Now my question is, would he call Ezekiel a savage wolf? Because Ezekiel says in chapter 9 and verse 4 that we must sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the land, in the church. Would he call Isaiah a savage wolf? Isaiah says we must cry aloud and spear not. Lift up the voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob yes. their sins. Would he call John the Baptist a savage wolf? John the Baptist who called the church and the world to repentance and even called those Pharisees and Sadducees a generation of vipers. And we are called by God in these last days to bear a still more pointed testimony than that was born by John the Baptist. Would he call Christ Jesus a savage wolf when even Jesus laid out before the Pharisees, the scribes and Sadducees that they were hypocrites, a generation of vipers? He does not want preachers that would bring about revival and reformation. He calls them savage wolves. Let's take a look at the second point. Hillary. The second bullet point reads, faults the current church logo. Now note the word current. The word current implies that there was an original and that original was the three angels, the logo, the banner that God gave to his people, which delineates their history, their message and their movement, their mission. Amen. The spirit of prophecy prophesied as well that this would be changed, that our logo would be changed. And what does that change signify? A change in the message, a change in the mission. Yes. And so the reason why Jeremiah Davis and others are raising the voice of concern against this new current logo is because of this change that was prophesied of in second selected messages, page 384. This is a direct attack on the spirit of prophecy. And if you attack the spirit of prophecy, you're indeed attacking, attacking the Bible. So the, the president, wants us to remain silent as the, the churches drift away from God's standard of truth. Absolutely. And if we dare say anything, he calls God's messengers savage wolves. 
the third point says dismisses the current issue or the current version the current edition of the great hope book this implies that there is an original version of the great controversy book written by ellen g white over well approximately 600 pages written in 19 11 or the 1884 versions and uh, sister white says this book the unabridged version must go to every home in the world to prepare a people to stand for god when the mark of the beast crisis becomes a reality yet elder ted wilson stood up before the whole church and said church we are going to evangelize the world and we are going to print, we are going to publish, we are going to distribute the book, The Great Controversy, to the whole world, he said. So everyone believed it would be the unabridged, the full copy, The Great Controversy, only to find out that it was a mere abridged version, a mere pamphlet, not even 200 pages. In that small little pamphlet book called the great hope this was a bait and switch event and we are to remain silent mr president no we can't do that we have liberty of conscience we saw what happened this is deceptive now we have other books from ellen g white that we have a bridged version of such as the desire of ages we have a smaller copy called uh, christ our savior but this was not what the president said he said the great controversy and now gave us the great hope and in the great hope we see a removal of all the chapters that address the true controversy a removal of even those chapters which show the reformers they protested against the arbitrary control of church leaders over the people mm. so since we have seen this deception are we to remain silent no we cannot regarding jeremiah davis and other such pastors bullet point four says the following has not been permitted to address our church members via the church system of service request this simply means that if a speaker is to address a local congregation, he must go through the appointed channels and request an appointment, which means basically that the right is reserved by the conference leaders to either grant the request or to deny the request, which again shows that the power does not rest with the members in the local churches. It rests with the few men at the top, the officials at the conference level, which again shows the hierarchical structure and the arbitrary control of church leadership. So basically what the president of the Central Kenya Conference is saying is that any speaker who is traveling to our churches, we have to vet them first. Yep. And if we do our research and if we discover that these speakers are speaking controversial messages then if we still decide to give them an opportunity to speak they have to sign our working policy wow. for this field wow. that's the vetting process it makes sense now why that part of the great controversy was stripped out exactly so mm -hmm. now we have seen this vetting process yeah. played out before in the account of david gates when the general conference team leaders, vice president, including Elder Ted Wilson, called a meeting with David Gates, stating that we have heard that you are preaching controversial messages. In order for you to continue to travel around the world within Seventh-day Adventism, David Gates, you have to sign the General Conference Working policy which is which is very similar to asi working policy and what this kenyan president is stating in the letter are similar words to the working policy 
When David Gates read it, he said he could agree with a few of the points, but there was one he could not agree with, stating, number six, supporting ministries, providing services outside their own division territory shall consult with and secure approval via the union from the division administration concerned regarding the nature, the extent. In other words, you must tell them when you're coming, how long, and even what you're going to preach. Wow. They have control over that. Mm. And David Gates says to sign this document would mean he would, signing, he would be signing away his liberty of conscience. Right. So he refused at that time to sign. And the general conference leaders did send out the letter to the worldwide field banning David Gates from speaking in the various churches. Wow. This sounds similar to an event that happened in Florida, Hillary, just a few uh, weeks ago. With whom? With Doug Batchelor. Correct. When they banned him yes. from from speaking not only in the Floridian churches, but also in the Southern Union, I heard. But now notice. So now, if uh, these uh, present truth speakers, so-called, if we see some of them still preaching around mm. in various churches, it means then that they have indeed signed that document the working policy. They have indeed signed away their liberty of conscience. This president and others are standing as keepers of the gate. They're barring the church from individuals who have present truth to reach the sheep. So who are really the savage wolves? Mm. So my question is now, how are we going to reach the sheep the sincere people in the churches. If this president and others, other leaders, are barring the church doors, how are we going to reach the sheep? Because Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 1 through verse number 6, Jesus places a woe upon the four shepherds. Mm. In Matthew 23, Christ says that they were keeping people out of the kingdom. And there's a woe in Matthew 23. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yes. They would not enter in themselves. Mm -hmm. And those who were trying to enter in, they bar them, kept them back. Christ says, I am going to raise up true shepherds to feed my people. But how will we reach them? How did John the Baptist reach them? You see, since John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ's first advent and we are called to be forerunners of Christ's second advent, the sheep had to come to hear John the Baptist. Why? Because John the Baptist established ministries, locations, venues for preaching, teaching, training, and baptizing outside of the synagogues of that day. That work we are called to do. What about Christ? The same work. His work was largely outside of the temple and synagogues. That was where you see Christ being more effective. This is how we're going to reach the sheep who are sincere. Let's read on. Can I just say yes. this? That also, every time you do find Christ trying to preach, even his very first sermon, reading from the books, the book, the Bible, the scrolls, he was kicked out of the synagogue. So he didn't even have an opportunity to present within. So who were the savage wolves in the days of Christ? The next subheading reads, concerns about youth groups. Now in this section of the letter, he moves off from Jeremiah Davis and the savage wolves. And now he goes into some other groups that he is telling his pastors and elders to be aware of, which are the Adventist Association of Young Professionals, as well as the vibrant group. We don't know much about this group, these groups, but this is what he says. As an independent ministry or supporting ministry, this group does not have the blessings of the local conference leadership. So basically he's telling his pastors, beware of this group simply because they do not have the authorization of the conference. So would this not apply to any other group that is self-supporting independent of the conference? 
They're telling them, beware of them. Don't give them a hearing. They are to be shunned. Now, my question would be this. How would he reconcile his philosophy about not listening to people outside of the regular conference lines with the statements, countless statements given in the spirit of prophecy, such as the one written in manuscript release, volume three, page 264, which states the following, that many should be working outside of the regular lines. So apparently something isn't working right in the regular lines. Why she's calling many to be working outside of the regular lines. What about the one in general conference bulletin, which states that the conference, the regular lines will prove a failure and a snare. snare. And there's two pointed statements in Spalding and McGann, one on page 176 that says, shall men go to the regular lines no. to see how they are to work? So that means should we have to beg permission to go and work when God has given us our mandate and how and where and when we are to work? And there's another statement on page 195 that says if if a hundred laborers, a hundred laborers step outside of the regular lines that the Lord would bless. But let's move on again. It, it, it's all pointing back to the arbitrary control and abuse, I would say, of church authority. In addition to that, notice now how it is not a big deal for these same administrators within Seventh-day Adventists to allow the preachers, speakers from Babylon mm. to come into Seventh-day Adventist churches, sing, lecture, teach, and preach. They're not a part of the conference, are they? So mm. it's two things. The th Two things going on here. Number one, we must give you the okay. You must kiss the image of jealousy at the gate. And number two, we don't want you preaching messages that show us up. No present truth. That is the issue here. Let's move on. Now let's take a look at section C. It reads, other teachings based mainly on unfulfilled prophecy and false interpretation of Bible doctrines. Under this section, A, it says, the savage wolves are those who teach 2520, those who question the Trinity. Now you think about this. Yet these are the same men who don't question those who are pushing the false theories of the emerging church movement. Those who are pushing and teaching contemplative prayer, centering prayer, spiritual formation. Those who are a part of the one project movement within Seventh-day Adventism, who are really the wolves, the savage wolves. They don't question those within Seventh-day Adventism who are not preaching the distinctive messages of God's three angels' messages. Right. In these churches, the judgment message, unheard of. Right. The sanctuary, 1844, unheard of. Dress reform, health reform, for the most part, these doctrines are not being preached as a result the church members within these local churches, they are giving the Macedonian call. Come over here. Give us present truth. Why? Our pastors aren't preaching it. The, refo mm -hmm. the reforms are null and void in these churches. These presidents don't question these pastors. L let's keep on down. What about those who are conducting calf worship? Are they questioned? Not at all. Are they, don't they go vetted? through a vetted process. Mm. Not at mm. all. Those no. who are participating and leading out in the celebration type worship in the churches. But what about the LGBT? Those who support the lifestyle of the LGBT movement. Are they questioned? No, they're welcome to give mm. symposiums. It says over emphasis on medical missionary. No, I want to emphasize this point. Look at the overemphasis that he places on point C. Not only are the letters in all caps, which imply that he's 
shouting or he really wants to get our attention, but he underlines it, underlines it as well, overemphasis on medical missionary work. Now, what does the Bible and the spirit of prophecy say? This whole Bible is a health manual. So is the Bible overemphasizing the medical missionary work? Is the book medical ministry overemphasizing the medical min uh, missionary work? Wow. So the thing of it is the Bible, well, the spirit of prophecy says that Christ did more healing than he did even preaching. Yes. And that is, it's, it's validated in scripture. And furthermore, we are told that the medical missionary work is the entering wedge of the gospel. Amen. So how is the gospel going to be proclaimed in all the world without the emphasis on the medical missionary work? That means there's no urgency because you've taken the entering wedge. How's the door going to open? So now, not only is he saying we are too urgent and too aggressive in evangelism, which spirit would say, in these closing moments of Earth's history, you are too aggressive Correct. with evangelism. When the Bible clearly says that we must not only look for, but we must hasten the second coming of Jesus Christ. That means right. we must carry forward aggressive evangelism. And it says, I must work the works of him who has sent me while it is day. Why? The night cometh when no man, when can, no man can work. Amen. And connected with the giving of the everlasting gospel is the medical missionary work. That's Which right. spirit would, would possess someone to say that we are overemphasizing medical missionary work? Number one, the work is so broad. Right. And number two, medical missionary work is not only the entering wedge, but it is a gospel in practice. Mm -hmm. So if he says, since he says we're overemphasizing it, that means we are overemphasizing the gospel, practicing the gospel. Wow. We want to make it clear that this is not an isolated event only sectioned off in, in Kenya. Because even the North American division, Hillary, you can remember this, the North American division changed the name medical missionary and came up with comprehensive, comprehensive health. health. You remember that, comprehensive health. So now that implies a the emphasis of medical missionary right. work. How so? God did not give us the name comprehensive health. No. He gave us medical missionary work. Ellen White says that name is inspired by God. Mm. And number two, number two, they say we want the whole church to now used the term comprehensive health and we have to train you and wow. if we don't train you you cannot carry forward the health work so we are back to the hierarchical structure we are back to the dumbing down of god's people the removing of liberty of conscience you have to come through us we hold your conscience Wow. So now these are the same individuals who would uh, and who will invite world physicians That's right. who will come and say a little flesh food is good. A little wine, liquor is good for the heart. Have I have heard these things in my ears and they will tell you a little drugs, pharmaceutical drugs. These things are good for you. All right. So now my question is, since these men have barred the gates, the doors to the churches, and have placed an image of jealousy there, how are we going to reach the sincere sheep? And this tells me something, Hillary. Mm -hmm. Most of these so-called present truth medical missionaries, preachers who are running around these churches, it says something. Compromise. They have kissed the image of jealousy at the gate. They have signed that document, signed away right. their liberty of conscience. But what's sad to me is that, yes, pastors are called to be gatekeepers, but they're allowing the apostates in while they're keeping those out who would preach the straight testimony. So now, how are we going to reach them? with the health work, right? And the gospel. Not inside the gate. How did Jesus reach the people? Because he healed them. Right. Where was most of Christ's healing done? 
either in the sanctuary or on the outside. Where was most of Christ's healing done? Most of Christ's healing were done on the outside. And what does ministry of healing say? That Christ's methods alone will bring what? Success. True success. success. Let's read on. Wonderful. Before he closes the letter, Central Kenya Conference President John Nguni puts the following, mm. and he brings the issue back to Jeremiah Davis now. It says, soliciting funds on behalf from the Seventh-day Adventist Church members to sponsor Jeremiah Davis is not allowed. Since Jeremiah Davis does not come to us through the church organization procedure of service request. Now, this is apparent that Jeremiah Davis was scheduled to speak sometime in Kenya, mm -hmm. whether at a local conference church or, you know, at a separate venue, we just, we don't know. But the issue still is whether it, it matters not where he holds the meeting, whether it's at a, a local church, he's telling the pastors, bar the doors, don't let him in. He cannot speak here. He doesn't have our blessing, our authority. The door is barred for him. If he does, want to have them or is scheduled to have the meeting outside of a local uh, conference church at a separate venue, the members are still being told that they can't go because remember Jeremiah, according to this, Jeremiah Davis is a savage wolf. And so what we see here again is bullying, the bullying of these members, these sheep, these vulnerable sheep by the conference leadership having their, uh, and we see the hierarchical structure again. And it's also that the president and his uh, team, they are restricting the liberties of the people in the local churches. And I know personally, when people hear this, what's going on, they are going to be shocked to know that this is happening to men like David Gates, and uh, Jeremiah Davis. Right. For these men are staunch supporters of conference organization, the, the conference work. You should not do anything outside of conference approval. Stay in the church. But I was not surprised when I heard this and read this floating around social media. And that's why I had to say something. I saw this coming because I know Jeremiah Davis personally, I'm not speaking of him based on things someone else told me of him. We went to Oakwood together. We have done ministry together, especially in the early months and years of our ministries. We have done meetings together. So I know him personally. And uh, I know and I knew that Jeremiah Davis does preach present truth. I know it. I have known many individuals who have dated their conversion based on listening to Jeremiah Davis. So when they hear this, Hillary, they're going to be shocked. Right. How could they do this to Jeremiah Davis, who preaches present truth and tell us to stay in the church? I believe that Jeremiah Davis and others who preach and say, you know, they preach present truth mm -hmm. and they expose the abominations, especially in leadership mm -hmm. within Seventh day Adventism. They thought as long as they would say afterwards, stay in the church, don't leave the church, don't go to other meetings that are separate from the conference, stay in the church, that that would allow the conference pastors, elders, and administrators to continue to keep the doors of the local churches opened to them. But they're members. He's a member, is he not? Hillary. Mm -hmm. Yes, there, I believe Jeremiah and others are members of local churches within the conference right. of Seventh-day Adventism. But now we are seeing the conference leaders do not care about that. Their issue is 
Are you preaching messages that exposes the sins within Seventh-day Adventism? It doesn't matter if you're a member. We are going to marginalize you as we did it to Doug Batchelor, right. to David Gates. We would do it to you Even and Paul others. Miller in the Bahamas. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I would not be surprised if, 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 if the facts came out that the Kenya conference is not the only conference that has barred Jeremiah Davis. Because I am aware, I've been told that even conferences within the NAD, the North American Division, have various lists upon which pastors' names are written and they're blacklisted. They cannot enter these churches, even if they tell their, uh, uh, their supporters, stay in the church. And one thing we need to understand, this doctrine and theory telling people, stay in the church, stay in the church. What's going to happen if these individuals go back to the same churches where they came from to come and hear you? Mm -hmm. And their elders and their pastors are just conducting gross apostasies in the church. What if they become changed mm -hmm. into what they behold week after week, Sabbath after Sabbath, and they're lost? Whose blood? would their blood be upon? Whose hands would their blood be upon? These are things that we have to consider. Jeremiah and others have to consider with those uh, theories, even though they're very sincere. A another argument that people use is the whole idea about the wheat and the tares. What, ab what about that? Now, when we think about the wheat and tares, yes, people use that, okay? Now, I encourage individuals to go back and look at Matthew 13 and even in Christ object lessons. To whom was Christ speaking? Do not uproot the tears, let both grow together. He was talking to the disciples. This idea of wheat and tears growing together will only take place and can only take place when the leaders are weak only take place in that, in that scenario. Why? All throughout scripture and all throughout history, whenever the leaders are the tears, mm -hmm. what always happened to the people and the prophets and the preachers? You go back to Ahab and Jezebel. Right, right. Let's start right there with Elijah and Obadiah hiding the prophets and Jezebel and Ahab killing the prophets. We can go back to even Christ's day the leaders were the tears. They uprooted Christ and killed Christ. We go back to the reformers. Whenever leaders are the tears, the wheat, the wheat and tears scenario does not work. And not only you mentioned the persecution, but also sometimes the, the wheat actually compromise just to save their reputation or exactly. their, their very lives. Exactly. And I know that there are many individuals now who have once listened to the idea, stay in the church, don't let the wheat and tears go together, hold up the light. I know many individuals now who once believed that as they went back to their local churches and they are holding up the light as it were, in, in presenting principles of right. present truth, they realize it does not work because the elders are in apostasy, right. the pastors are in apostasy, they are shunned, they are marginalized, they are called offshoots, extremists, fanatics. And Jesus tells us in the book of early writings, page 124 and 125, that we must not sit under apostate leaders. Nowhere in scripture, nowhere in the Bible does Christ authorize and permit his people to sit on the leaders who are drinking in false doctrines and serving it. It's right. not there. Right. Whenever we see Christ in the synagogues, he went to preach. Mm. He went to minister. That's it. Whenever we see Christ ministering, he was the one leading out. So now people say that was just for us not listening to Babylon, men in Babylon. What's the difference? 
when the pastors now in Adventism are preaching from the books written by Babylonians, Many infidels. Many get their masters and doctorates from non-Seventh-day Adventist institutions No, as well. where does Christ say it's okay to sit under these ministers? Correct. No. So what are we to do? We go back. We look at Christ's ministry in Matthew 15. What did, did Christ ever say it's okay to go back and sit under the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes Absolutely who were not. tears in leadership? You know. Matthew 15, he says, these are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind follow the blind, if the blind lead the blind, both fall into the ditch. The ditch. You go back to Acts chapter 2, mm -hmm. long before probation close on the Jewish people in Acts 7, Acts 8, in AD 34. The disciples in Acts 2, verse 40, 41, when they came to hear the disciples, they didn't send them back to go and sit under the tears. They said, flee, save yourselves from this untoward generation. So I believe Jeremiah, I believe, and others, have uh, maybe four options. One, they may have to just flee to some other city. I've heard many of them say, well, Matthew 10 say, Christ says, if they persecute in one city, right. flee to the next city. Mm -hmm. Also read Luke 10 with that, okay? And remember, as you flee, the document from one city and the other two cities, the previous cities, are going to follow you. The modern-day papal bull is going to follow you. And the other conference leaders are going to say, if you were banned from over there That's and right. over there in Kenya, in the NAD, we, we may have to put a question mark beside your name. We can't allow you to come in right now. They're all on one accord. Or, exactly. Or number two, he and others may have to say, you know what, let's just yield, let's just compromise just to reach the people mm -hmm. like others have already done. Or number three, just stop doing ministry. I know Jeremiah, I don't think he's going to stop doing ministry. So he will make one of these decisions because he loves the people. He loves God. He wants people to be safe. I know him personally. Number four, he, may, he and others may have to, you know, reevaluate the stance that they have taken. You know, Hillary, I have seen he and others, they used to believe that you can never, you shouldn't hold meetings outside of the conferences on Sabbath morning, 11 o'clock meetings. Shouldn't, don't do it, okay? Because even in, in, in Atlanta and other places, they would hold meetings on Friday evenings. No meetings on Sabbath morning. And then a meeting on Sabbath evening. You see, mm -hmm. all of a sudden now, they have pivoted, changed that stance, and now you're seeing more, more frequently the holding of meetings outside of the conferences, even on Sabbath morning. So I hope they go to, they go to God in prayer, we are praying for them that they will not become discouraged. Jeremiah and others, don't become discouraged. These things were prophesied. Gird up your loins and let's keep moving forward, but doing it the way that will bring true success. Christ's methods alone will bring the true success. And lastly, I want to say, we have to pray for these individuals. The conference president here in Kenya, um, Doug Batchelor, David Gates, Jeremiah, all the others, everyone who has been implicated in this and other similar issues. Even the pastors that this was sent to, we have to they'll pray make for them. the right decision as well. We have to pr because we have one enemy, and that one enemy is uh, the devil. That's right. We have to pray for them. Amen. Father in heaven, we're thankful that we were given knowledge of this situation to speak up for our brother, our brothers in ministry, to speak up for our own people. We even pray for John and Gunye. 
and the pastors, not only in Kenya, but those in the NAD and around the world. Dear God, please revive and reform, awaken them from their spiritual stupor and encourage us, your workers, that we will not become faint hearted, but that we will look the work squarely in the face and march forward in the strength of Jesus Christ. And I pray, silence the gossipers and those who are only here to point fingers and criticize while they're on the sidelines, yet refuse to put on the whole armor of God to get into the battlefield for you, snatching souls from deception, whether they're in the churches or in the world, so you may have a people prepared for your coming. Save us, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.